So coming up it is a very, very exciting and special lunar eclipse on May 26th, or depending where you are in the world, the 25th to the 27th. And from what I understand, it's not going to be just a total lunar eclipse, but also a supermoon. Could you tell me a bit about what this means and what's really coming up? Yeah, the supermoon, people get really hooked on the supermoon word. And the way to think of supermoons is that the first, the term supermoon was not coined by an astronomer. It's not a technical term. It's, it's actually a very loosely defined term, but it's attempting to tell you that the moon is particularly close to the earth while it's full. So, you know, the moon is on an eccentric orbit where it gets, uh, it's not always at the same distance. It's not a per perfect circle. It's slightly eccentric. So it's, sometimes it's a little further, sometimes it's a little bit closer. And when the moon is a little bit further away, it is appearance in, in the sky will appear a little bit smaller. And when it's really close to you, it'll appear a little bigger. Now, most people, the average human, and even the really good eyed human can't tell the difference. You know, like it's a very subtle difference that you see. Um, and it's not like tonight you walk out and it's at apogee, where it's, it's farthest from you. And then the next night you walk out and it's closest and you can be like, hey, the moon's closer tonight than it was last night. It's a gradual change. And so that's also why people don't necessarily notice. So the super moon aspect is though, um, it is particularly close, but that, that does have an impact on eclipses because when it's close, it actually moves through the shadow faster uh, because when you're closer, you're gonna move faster through. So it's, it, the eclipse happens quicker than it would if it were an apogee new moon and that that's for our um for the lunar eclipse right because the lunar eclipse is or sorry full moon i'm i'm on um uh, i'm on the solar eclipse um so a, a total lunar eclipse happens when you have the sun um shining its light on the moon and the earth's shadow cat it's a nice lineup and the earth's shadow gets in the way and casts over the moon um, so the moon will be passing as it's going around the earth. It goes around the earth and it passes through the shadow. But because it's close to us, it passes through that shadow quicker than if it were what we would call a micro full moon, a micro moon. As then it would take longer because things that are further away, just like the giant planets in our solar system that are the furthest, they have really long periods as they go around the sun. So it takes them longer to go around. Inner planets orbit really fast. The outer planets go slower. So that's that's really the critical aspect of the supermoon. If you if if you want to test yourself to see if you can tell a difference, I'm not even fully sure how close this full moon is, but it's a fun thing to look up, like how close the full moon is to you uh, in its approach. But otherwise, it's it's usually a really fun experience to go and look at a total lunar eclipse. So that stands out outside of the fact that it's this super moon, full moon. Definitely. Now, I know a lot of people are also calling this a blood moon. And I know that in general, total lunar eclipses can look different colors. Could you explain a bit about why and if there's any way we can kind of anticipate what the lunar eclipse might look like? Yeah, so uh, the, the lunar eclipses are not predictable in really any way for astronomers to tell you because it has everything to do what's in the Earth's atmosphere on the day that the lunar eclipse happens. So the Earth's shadow gets, the Earth gets in the way of the moon getting sunlight. So the Earth gets in the way of the moon. Um, but the light from the sun is passing through the Earth's atmosphere and then it gets cast on the moon. So it's not the light directly hitting the moon. Instead, what hits the moon is the light that passes through our atmosphere. And so that should remind you of sunrises and sunsets. At sunrise and sunset, you get these gorgeous pinks and yellows and oranges. But I think most people would admit you have no idea how to predict what any given sunrise or sunset is going to look like. It's 
a nice cloud will cast you a gorgeous looking sun sunrise or sunset. And so because of that, we just don't know if there's a lot of volcanic eruptions, for instance, that are going on on the planet that toss a lot of material into the upper atmosphere, that can create some gorgeous colors. So it all depends on what's happening on that day in those moments. But you can pretty much get, you'll usually generally get a brownish hue and the depth to that brownish reddish hue is going to be highly dependent on what is happening on the earth that day. Totally. So, you know, obviously astronomers, you know, love to go outside and look up, but especially around big lunar events like eclipses, families uh, with young kids often use it as an opportunity to look up and, and learn about the moon. I'm curious if you have any tips or tricks for families trying to view the eclipse and the moon from home. My tips for viewing total lunar eclipses would include having patience. It's not something that all of us have anymore where you're willing to go out and watch for a while, but a lunar eclipse does last for a long time. And uh, I suggest getting yourself someplace comfortable and not thinking of it as something that you're going to walk outside, glance up, see, and then go back inside and you're done. Think of it more like you would a Netflix movie or, you know, a show. Get yourself ready in that same way. Get yourself some popcorn, you know, some a glass of something good. Get yourself a little seat, a cozy seat, so that you can see that like a nice clear view of the moon get there before it goes into the maximum stage where it's in the darkest part of the eclipse so that you're seated, you're ready, and just kind of watch it unfold. It's fun to watch, but I, I, I highly suggest that people watch for the length of time it takes it to go through maximum eclipse. Uh, and that's really going to apply only to a portion of the planet, though, since this eclipse, I think, while it is viewable across North America and then uh, um, and and even in some parts of uh, across to Europe, it, it looks like it's a very Pacific Ocean kind of thing. So Australia has got a great spot for it. But like us on the Northeast, we're not getting much of it at all. Um and the West Coast is getting a little bit more of it. So your side of town, <laughs> your side of, of the country will get a little bit more of it. So from that perspective, still, even if you're only getting a portion of like the penumbral part of the eclipse when it's not in the, the um, darkest part, go out there for a while and really observe the differences. Like look at the sky in general, take a look at some stars while you're out there, while the moon usually dims uh, or sorry, it makes it so that you can't see your dimmer stars. As it starts to get eclipsed, it gets dimmer and the stars will start to look brighter to you. And so that's a fun thing to do, to go and look around. So all of that, I would just like take it in, take the night sky in. Don't just think of it as a lunar eclipse viewing thing. Take it in as like a sky watching thing. Definitely. Yeah, that's really great advice um, because I've never even thought of it that way that because the moon is going to be dimmer, it, it's a rare opportunity to really get a great look at some bright stars that otherwise might be kind of tricky to see. Yeah, well, during, so when the moon is not up during new moon, you can go out and see them, but this is a fun opportunity to see the moon and the stars at the same time, which you usually don't get to see because the moon is a giant flashlight in the sky for us, so. Definitely. But so patience, snacks, and a comfortable place to sit seem to be probably the biggest, the biggest things on, on, on the list. Yeah, I put all three of those. Patience, for sure. I give that advice for a lot of astronomical phenomenon, meteor showers, uh, looking at a conjunction, looking for the planets. Like, don't just think of it as something like, okay, it's nine o'clock, I'm gonna run outside. Just think of it as like, okay, we're going to a sky movie, you know, like I, I like to also say that the nighttime sky is the original movie theater. It was the original entertaining zone for people. 
make up stories and what you see in the stars, make up stories of what the moon is doing, get comfortable, get cozy, and then stick it out for a while. Let yourself really take it in. It takes a while for your eyes to adjust. It takes a while for your eyes to get dark adjusted. Um, and for you to like really pay attention to what's there. The longer you stare at the sky, the more you see. Definitely. I, I love I love the description of a sky movie. I think that really encapsulates yeah. it. Yeah, definitely. And it is. It's the original movie theater. And I, I really hope that people enjoy it, especially with this exciting event coming up. Yeah, no, definitely. Definitely. Um, now, I, I know that kind of lunar eclipses, we know what's happening. But I'm curious, from a scientist's perspective, are eclipses uh, an opportunity to learn or are they more so an educational experience for sky watchers at home? Uh, so I, I, I think I'm not, I cannot remember the details here, but so you can fact check me on this, but I believe that there was a really cool result that somebody used the Hubble Space Telescope to look at the moon during an eclipse. So usually you can't you can't turn like telescopes like astro astronomical observatories that we used to do high end science. We can't turn those observatories towards the moon. It's too bright. It would blow out the detector. You know, it just saturates it like shining a big shining bulb at your iPhone when you're trying to take a picture kind of thing. But during an eclipse, it's heavily um, faded down. And so I believe they were t there was a cool result where they were trying to figure out what the you're getting the light of the Earth passing through, sorry, the sun's light passed through Earth's atmosphere, reflected back at you through the eclipse. And I think somebody turned the Hubble Space Telescope to it. So yes, you can totally learn during an eclipse, something like that, because we're constantly trying to think of like, what does our world look like to people that don't live on this world, you know? And an eclipse is a great opportunity to explore that because you are getting the light passed through Earth's atmosphere, which tells you all sorts of tales about what's going on. I was just telling you, we don't even know what the light's gonna look like on the moon. But in that same vein, right, like if you were to take that light and say, OK, I don't even know what's happening on the earth. I'm going to close my eyes and pretend I'm not here. I'm just going to look at the light reflecting back from the moon, pass it through a spectrograph or something and see what it's composed of. You could say, hey, I see a lot of something that's reminiscent of volcanic ash on the planet or Maybe you'll be able to check out like, what if we're giving off biosignatures through the atmosphere that you can then detect back, reflected backwards. So we do try and do this when we're looking out at worlds beyond earth. We try and take data on them as the light's passing through the, the um, transmission spectroscopy. So you're kind of seeing planets through their host stars. So we're constantly like making guesses at what we're seeing. And this is something similar. So yeah, you can totally do science during an eclipse. That's fascinating. It's like, it's almost like looking at Earth like we look at exoplanets. Yeah, so, that's that's exactly what it is. You're looking at Earth the way that we are trying to look at exoplanets. So we're always trying to put ourselves in the reverse vantage point. Wow. So I, I just have one more question about the lunar eclipse. Uh, and it's just, are you going to watch it? Yes. <laughs> it's not much for us here in New York. But um, but I'm going to try and get a glimpse of what it's going to look like here. And I'm also going to create some cool visuals of it using open space. Wow. So as you know, I love open space and open space is our planetarium software that we have at AMH. &H. So I'm going to create some visuals. I can also send those to you if you want to use anything on space.com. That would be fantastic. Absolutely. I would love that. Yeah. So um, so for since since I am in New York. Uh, we don't, we really don't get much. We just get the, when it's in the, 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 um, the less dark shadow. So there's the penumbral part of the eclipse, um, which is the, so there's a dark shadow to the earth. The earth has a dark shadow and then it's got like a, a lighter shadow. And so we're basically getting the lighter shadow and, uh, 
and it happens very early in the morning. But uh, but yeah, I'm definitely gonna watch it. You okay. should watch it too. Oh, I plan on it, and nice. I think everyone at home should to plan on it. You know, even if they don't have the biggest, most exciting view, I think I think that would be great.